I think uh, now is a good time to start. Thank you everyone for uh, taking a chunk of your evenings to attend this public event online. Um, we appreciate you kind of taking the time and uh, thank you for all the questions that have been sum submitted already. Uh, my name is Edward Dickinson. I'm going to be kind of leading this presentation. Uh, we're going to uh, talk you through. It should take an hour and a half. We hope to be done before uh, eight o'clock. Um, so I'll just go through the initial slides. Bit of introductions. So I introduce myself, but also we've got Kathy Stevenson, the uh, project lead, Andrew Houston, who's a senior project manager, and Emily Collins, who's engagement support and helping me with this presentation. Um, just to start off, give you a bit of an overview of the format of the meeting. We are recording this event with the hope that then we can put it onto YouTube afterwards for people who have not been able to attend. It's going to be roughly a 45 minute presentation and then a 45 minute question and answer session. Um, we are working with the platform Slido for uh, taking people's questions. Um, that's slido.com. It's relatively straightforward. You can go on either your computer or, or onto your phone and you type in hashtag York C1 and you'll be able to go in and submit your question. Um, we're going to go through a practice uh, question on Slido just to get people familiar with it. If you are wanting to use it, feel free to uh, submit questions as we go. And there'll obviously be a chance to submit the questions after. Um, what we aim to do with the question and answer session is to prioritize those questions which have been upvoted. So there's a little thumb upwards from a uh, symbol that you'll see. So that means you, know, you want that question to be prioritized. Um, and then after we've kind of gone through the more popular ones, so to speak, I'm going to look to prioritize questions from people who haven't had a chance to ask a question yet, just to make it sure that it's kind of fair and inclusive. Um, after the event, we'll circulate a written summary, as well as a link to the YouTube event. And if there are any questions where we have to go back, go away and get more detail, then we'll obviously make sure to include that in the written summary or have uh, emails to the relevant people. Um, so here's a little practice run. Don't worry if you don't want to take part in this, but it's just to get people comfortable with Slido. Uh, oh, we've already had someone respond. That's fantastic. Um, so it's just a very quick question about, you know, who's joining us? Uh, are you a local resident or are you from the wider York area? Are you attending as a councillor or a member of a membership organisation? Um, so we'll just give you 30 seconds. Uh, and I say you can log in either via your phone or via um, your computer and just use that York C1. Uh, hello to those who have just uh, been admitted into the chat. We're just doing a little poll. It's a single question on the Slido platform just to get people comfortable with how it works because that's where we'll be asking people to submit their questions. Um, we'll just spend another 20 seconds on this and then we'll move on. And I should also say, if you aren't comfortable with using the Slido platform or you don't want to register to it, um, that's totally understandable. What I would ask is if you could submit your question in the chat function in Zoom, uh, but direct it to Emily Collins, um, then she can upload it onto Slido later on, which helps. Okie dokie. So thank you to those who've taken part in that. Um, we'll move on. Uh, so just at a very high level, what we're going to cover here is just a refresh of your input into this presentation, the surveys that we circulated, uh, what we've done so far, uh, what we need to do now, how you're likely to be affected and what the scheme will look like, um, and then a little bit on engagement risks and other matters, and then the question and answer session at the end. So in terms of your input, thank you so much to everyone who filled in the survey. We circulated it about three and a half weeks ago, just asking people to tell us a bit more about what they were aware of regarding the scheme or what, the, what they were less so and what areas they would like to us to prioritize in the session. And this is the result of that. We got 47 responses, so very, thank you very much for that. Um, in terms of what was flagged as areas for us to focus on and what people need more information on, we've got uh, measures to take into limit noise, the decision for a, a process for locating the construction compounds, our construction timeline and the environmental impact of the construction. So hopefully we cover all those issues in this presentation for you. But obviously, please feel free to ask any additional questions after. In terms of what you wanted us to prioritize, uh, construction traffic, noise, 
tree removal, what the removal will look like and the construction compound. So again, hopefully we cover all those issues for you. Um, in terms of what we've done, this is very high level, but um, obviously we've been developing the overall scheme, which is quite a complicated process. It's a two and a half million pound scheme. We've held a uh, public drop-off event back last October. We've worked with local landowners. We've now gained planning uh, approval and we've secured funding to go ahead with the scheme. Um, and here's a little timeline. It's something that we circulated in the handout uh, just to show uh, key dates, both in terms of our engagement and the planning process. Now I'm gonna pass you over to uh, Kathy Stevenson and she's gonna provide an overview of the flood scheme. Thank you, Edward, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so my part of the presentation is an overview of the flood scheme. And uh, in case anyone is in any doubt, especially at the moment, why we are doing it. So Bishop Thorpe has a, a history of flooding. And as I said, at the moment, we've got evidence of that on the ground uh, with water at the moment on Ferry Lane around St Andrew's Ruin and Bishop Salt's Palace. The large events of the last few years, the two photographs we have here, one from November 2000, which is a, uh, an event that stays in everybody's memory, I'm sure, um, and more recently, the December 2015. Um, these photographs both give um, a good indication of the way the water enters into the village when flooding is happening. Um, and the Chantry Lane area, where we are going to be placing the flood defences are highlighted here in the green box. Thank you, Ed. So the Bishop Thorpe scheme itself will better protect 117 properties. That's a mixture of 98 residential and the rest commercial. Um, and you can see from the uh, drawing and the, the diagram here, uh, there are properties that are directly affected. That's the 117 but there's also the wider Bishopthorpe area um, that benefits from uh, improved access um, and protection of access roads when there's a flood event. So the three four sources of flooding that we are looking to address in Bishopthorpe, the main one of course is the most obvious one coming overland from the River Ouse. Um, although in addition to that, we have an issue of seepage underground, which would compromise the um, effectiveness of any above ground flood defence that we put in place if we were not to address it. And then the third one, which is through the surface water drainage system, which runs down Chantry Lane and in normal times discharges into the ooze. Um, so there are issues with flood water coming back up from the river into this system and into the village and also the compromised nature of the, the, the surface water system in the village not being able to discharge out into the river. So the proposal of our scheme is to build a flood wall around the Dell crossing across the bottom of Chantry Lane, where there will be a floodgate, and then with an additional wall, which ties into high ground in the garden of the Chantry. There are a number of challenges in designing here, in particular, the bottom end of Chantry Lane. We're working in an area of significant cultural heritage and natural beauty, and we have to be sensitive to that. It's quite a small area to work in. Um, the dead end at the end of Chantry Lane has caused us problems. We need to ensure we retain security for both the Chantry property and the St. Trust, St. Andrew's Trust land while maintaining the space we need around our assets when they are built. We also have a requirement to maintain views down Chantry Lane through to the old ruin, an important part of the, the heritage of this area, while also maintaining vehicle and pedestrian access through the defence into the land beyond. We also have the challenge of keeping away from the area of consecrated ground in the old graveyard, 
and the graves that are in that area. And on top of that, meeting the highway authority requirements for road safety, as this is a public road. So we have put together some visualizations to try and give you an idea of what the scheme will look like. I'd like you to bear in mind that these photographs are taken with a very wide angle lens to provide you with an idea of the scheme as a whole. And that obviously just leads to some distortion. Um, however, during the determination of the planning application, we had site visits from a number of City of York Council officers, um, obviously on site, met with us and discussed things on the ground. So a couple of things to point out here, we will not be removing all of the trees on the south side of the dell. Some will be removed, some will be trimmed to allow us to work, but there will be a number of trees that remain and that will be covered later, in one of the later slides by one of my colleagues. The brickwork and the coping finish is still to be agreed with the City of York Conservation Officer as part of the discharge of the conditions on our planning approval. We've given you an idea here of the kind of finish that we're looking at. However, it will need to fit in with the whole aesthetic of the area and the brickwork of the surrounding buildings. I'd like you to note that the total height of the wall and the fence together will not exceed the current fence height. So at the moment, we have a very small wall with a wooden fence on top of it. The look of the scheme when it is finished is that the wall will be higher, but the fence will be lower so that the overall height will remain the same. It's also worth noting that all street furniture, the heritage curbing, etc., will be removed from site and restored at the end of the works. So looking down Chantry Lane now, getting up to the end where the flood gate will be. Again, this is a slightly wide angle shot so that we can give you a, an idea of, the, of the, uh, the whole of the arrangement at the bottom of Chantry Lane. So the opening that you're looking at is where the flood gate will sit when it needs to be deployed. That opening is five meters wide and is centered on the ruin of, the, of St Andrew's Church. The level of the defences are 9.83 metres above sea level. Um, the height of the wall, because the, the height of the ground below it varies, does vary from place to place, but generally it's about 60 centimetres or two feet uh, above ground level. So the level at which we have set the uh, height of the flood wall is the 100-year um, uh, event plus an allowance for climate change to 2117. The width of the wall, the width of the gateway that we've put there is the widest we can have without having to compromise the operation of the gate. And the gates, when they are not deployed, fold back against the riverwood side of the wall so they will and they're housed in metal housing so that's why they are not visible from this side of the um uh, of the of the flood wall so this is a, a a diagram that my colleague has put together which gives you an idea of the uh, what's going on underground so as i've said we have about 60 to 80 centimeters of flood wall above ground but below that is the uh, concrete foundation of the wall and then six metres of sheet piling, which go below ground, cutting off any seepage um, from the riverwood side when the water is up. The other part of the scheme then is what's going on underground in the surface water system. So at the moment there is a flat valve on the surface water uh, drain that drains through the Chantry uh, the St Andrews Trust land into the use. However, this can sometimes be compromised by debris during a flood event. So a more effective approach is that we are building two new manholes. The upstream one will have a penstock, which is a, a door or a shutter 
that will be dropped down in the manhole, which then will stop any flood water from the ooze working its way back into the surface system within Bishopthorpe. The larger manhole will also be able to facilitate, better facilitate pumping of any surface water that will then be over pumped onto the wet side of the wall. We have not been able to provide a dedicated pump as part of the scheme. Costings were, did not meet up for us to be able to do that. Um, and, uh, but in this location, pumping has historically been provided by City of York Council. However, during a large flood event, the location of pumping um, and the priorities for pumping is, de is decided by the local resilience forum. And the partners on that form will include the City Council, Yorkshire Water, the Environment Agency, as well as Fire and Rescue, who in some locations can provide pumps where necessary. One of the questions that has come up and certainly one of the challenges of the scheme is the choice of location for the compound. Now it has been a key challenge on this scheme due to the location of the works. There is no area uh, around Chantry Lane where we could locate the, uh, the compound to support the works. And so we've had to look elsewhere in the village. We've considered a number of different locations, um, but the considerations have ruled out quite a few of our choices. Important was for it to be close enough to the site to be able to reduce the impact of vehicle movements. Also finding an area that is outside of flood areas um, so that um, the scheme delivery is not compromised by flooding events as much as possible. We also have to take into account highway safety considerations and we've had a number of conversations with City of York um, highway safety officers around the location of the um, of the compound to avoid um, the 60 mile per hour speed limit zones um, and this is why we have uh, ended up locating the compound in a 30 mile an hour limit. We've also had to consider the current land use and the suitability of the land somewhere flat enough um, to be able to provide a, a, a sensible place to have um, a compound. And that is what has led us to Church Lane. Um, we have moved the compound location from original thoughts. Uh, so it is now located within the 30 mile an hour stretch and is the entrance onto the compound will also be opposite a field entrance rather than directly opposite entrances to properties. Uh, we've also moved it away from the pedestrian access uh, to the school. Um, but we'll go into a visualisation of what the compound will look like in one of the later slides. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. So what we'd like to do is uh, advise you of where we are and what we're going to do next and how we're going to keep the community informed. So our aim before the end of 2020 is to undertake a number of key activities. These are to help us satisfy our pre-construction conditions from the Planning Authority from City of York Council, but also um, we will also be completing final surveys and these constitute uh, a number of items such as highway surveys, footpath surveys, and also will be undertaken with our partners as well. As we do these works, we will be keeping the community informed. Uh, we are aware that we're going into further COVID restrictions and our suppliers and our partners will also be working and adhering to COVID guidance throughout. In terms of the planning conditions, we received approval for our scheme from City of York Council in August, following a lengthy planning period. At the moment, the team are working hard on discharging our pre-construction conditions. So we're not allowed to start any construction work until those have been satisfied and approved by City of York Council. And we're looking to start works early in 2021. 
further conditions that have to be discharged can be discharged once we have commenced construction and there are also a suite of conditions which we will discharge post construction and upon completion of our works. All of the conditions are specific to our works and notably focusing upon the design, but also how we will undertake the project and how we will deliver it safely. And we as an entity have to adhere to these conditions at all times. And also they will help us deliver the project for the safety of the public, but also for our operatives on site and ultimately provide benefit to the community from reduced flood risk. Just to note, if anybody would like to um, find out more information on the conditions that City of York Council have applied to our project, that there is a link, that, well, there is the information on the screen to the planning application reference, which can be accessed from City of York Council's planning portal and then search under that application reference. Just in terms of our pre-commencement surveys, so these are going to provide a detailed record of the condition of the existing surroundings. So as I've already mentioned, we're talking about highways, we're talking about footpaths, and this is to ensure we can reinstate these, these uh, pieces of land uh, surfaces to an as before condition or better condition where possible. And again, this will consist of dilapidation surveys, which will be undertaken with our partners, specifically highways officers from City of York Council, and the surveys must be signed off and agreed to by the council prior to any of our work commencing. Any existing damage will be notified and it will be documented um, and the respective owners of, of any land that's uh, been identified as damaged prior to our works commencing, uh, that will all be documented and they will be notified. Just moving on, I know trees uh, and how we're going to minimize the impact on trees is a key issue for Bishop Thorpe. So as part of our works, up to 23 trees uh, will be removed. We're not intending to remove all the trees in the dell. The trees we're focusing on are on the outer edge of the dell. So they're on the Chantry Lane extent and also Main Street and Bishop Thorpe Road. So as you can see on the screen, we're looking around the pink line, uh, as you can see on the graphic. And the circles are highlighting the root protection areas of those trees. So as, we, as we've already mentioned, those trees up to 23 will be removed and there will be a small suite of trees that will be removed from the grounds of the Chantry property. As I say, we have worked to minimize the number of trees impacted. We've undertaken surveys on some of the roots of the trees to try and see if we can save them. And also, should we need to install, well, when we install the piles, should we come across any tree roots that would need to be piled through, those trees will likely have to be removed on safety grounds because piling through the tree roots will cause stability issues. And we do not want at all any trees to fall over or cause any damage to property or members of the public. So it becomes a risk item and a safety item as to why some of the trees may be uh, removed as part of our works. However, where possible, if we can prune or pollard some of the trees and retain them and still do our works, we will seek to do that where possible. And the trees will regrow even with pollarding, there's no issue there. Um, but in also whilst we're doing this work, um, any felling of the trees will also be undertaken by licensed arborists, but also we will have ecologists present on site and they will monitor our activities and watching, they will use a watching brief and they will also advise us because we've undertaken studies uh, and had reports produced for any species that are present. So I know many, many residents will be able to confirm this, but we know there are bats present, not in the trees on the perimeter of the Dell, but we will have a licensed ecologist who is qualified to uh, move any bats should any be encountered as part of our tree felling works. And they'll also identify if there's any other species uh, that could be impacted and we will manage that accordingly. 
as a final point, um, as a business, we seek not to do any tree or vegetation removal during bird nesting season. So we're seeking to undertake this work outside of the months between March and September. For every tree that we will remove, we will replant, replant with five new trees. And these trees will be replanted in locations, ideally uh, in the Dell or close to the Dell or within Bishopthorpe, but they will be planted in agreement with the respective landowners and their consent. Where possible, we'll aim to replant with native species and also what we will do as part of our planning conditions, we will provide a detailed landscaping plan within three months of our construction activities commencing. And this will be submitted to City of York Council and this will document where we intend to replant all the trees. Um, and it will include details of the tree types, the size of trees, the number of trees and hedges. Should we not be able to uh, replant the trees in this area and also the Bishopthorpe community will work with our partners with City of York Council the, and the Woodlands Trust to identify other locations across York where we would be able to contribute to tree planting schemes. Okay, moving on to the site compound. So the site compound setup will take approximately two to three weeks. It will involve removal of 16 meters of hedge. And this is between two trees that you can see in the visualization. Um, this location actually manages to preserve the trees because the last thing we want to do is take down more trees than is actually required. In addition to this, we will install a 26 meter section of drop curbs and that will facilitate access into the compound. And we are following guidance from City of York Council highways that we will have a hard surface, so a concrete apron over the grass verge, which will be reinforced and protect the existing services that run within that verge. And that is just the concrete section that will lead into our compound area. To actually create the compound, our contractors will remove a 1500 meter squared section of topsoil and then that will be bonded around the perimeter of the construction compound. And this, uh, this uh, material will be replaced and then it will be reseeded once we've completed our construction and we've reinstated the field. For the actual base of the site compound, we'll put down a protective membrane and then we will uh, deliver some stone and we'll compact the stone and that will form the base. So the actual, the actual compound area is going to be stone. The only bit that's concrete is the entrance where you come from the compound onto the road. The reason for this is to prevent stone actually getting onto the highway because we don't want that to cause any safety issues. To secure the compound, the contractors will use an eight foot high security fence and obviously there'll be lockable gates with that as you can see. Um, but we would like to note that to do this, obviously setting up the compound will involve a number of deliveries from vehicles. So there'll be deliveries for site cabins, for equipment, and this is going to be staff welfare facilities as well. So this will be used by the operatives um, for the construction project and include all their welfare elements. Just as a further point to note, as you can see in the visualization, there is a um, a notice board or a sign information board. We are looking to confirm where we can install these within Bishopthorpe um, because we were not wanting to cause any safety issues and we're unable to put one on church, uh, not wanting to create any safety issues on Church Lane. So we're considering putting safety information and notice board information uh, at other locations such as the church hall or village hall notice boards. Um, but there will be the health and safety statutory and mandatory safety information uh, shown on our site compound. Okay, so how are you as the residents of Bishopthorpe likely to be affected from the scheme? So the areas you've highlighted as key areas for concern, construction traffic, local access and any potential restrictions, uh, the impact from noise and vibrations, 
as well as the environmental impact and also how long are we going to be there uh, on site while we do the works. Now, this obviously complements the survey results that were on slides seven and eight earlier in the presentation. So for construction traffic, as you can see, so we've got the site compound to the left of the screen, and then we have the plan showing the route between the site compound and the working area on Chantry Lane. We will have traffic coming down to the site compound from the A64, down past York College, along Symbolt Lane and turning onto Church Lane. The reason for this is it prevents vehicles going into the centre of Bishop Thorpe. It prevents them going past the main entrance to the infant school and also going past the junior school. Um, in addition, we are seeking to prevent vehicles where possible to go down main streets because there's numerous parked cars, there's uh, pedestrian crossings as well, and there's potential for blind spots. And it's always the intention of every construction project to minimize interaction with members of the public for safety reasons. As such, we're also going to try and schedule um, any conflicts uh, with deliveries and timings of that. We have stated in our planning conditions uh, times and working hours, which we will adhere to. So all works traffic will be restricted to between Monday and Friday, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And Saturday, if required, between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. We won't be working on Sundays and not on bank holidays either. We're also going to avoid peak hours for Bishop Thorpe because we have a site compound that's 100 metres from the secondary footpath entrance to the infant school. And we also know that there are parking laybys at the other end of Church Lane where it meets Symbol Lane, where parents do park to pick up and drop off their children for school. So we're seeking to avoid those key times of the day. And also we know that when there are race days at York Racecourse or the Navesmire, that this area and Church Lane is also a, an alternative route for some of the traffic to avoid the congestion further into York. Just a note for the site compound, all staff parking will be contained within the confines of the compound and materials that will be required for the projects. The majority of deliveries will go straight to Chantry Lane because that is the working area. So things like concrete, things like piles. We'll also install some signage for pedestrians to have safe access around our working area on Chantry Lane, uh, onto Bishopport Road and Main Street. And also, will there be some routing and signage for construction traffic? Just in terms of the local access, so our proposal, and this is subject to City of York Council's approval as part of the planning conditions, um, we know there's going to be some impact and we're going to manage that and minimize it where possible. Um, however, we do have the works to deliver, so there will be some disruption. At the moment, the largest impact will be to Chantry Lane and our construction works will commence at the eastern extent of Chantry Lane in front of the Chantry property. And then we'll work back along Chantry Lane towards Main Street and then turn north along Bishop Thorpe Road. Whilst we're undertaking this work, access to Chantry Lane will be restricted to residents of Chantry Lane for the majority of the work. In order to deliver the work, we will phase our work to try and keep access for residents uh, as much as possible. And the other reason for phasing the works and, and to, to keep this access is it manages the safety of residents as well as our site staff. Our priority though has to be the Chantry Lane residents because they will be impacted the most from the construction works. Whilst we undertake this work, we will be obtaining a full road closure of Chantry Lane from City of York Council. So this will be, um, meaning that access to the permissive path adjacent to St Andrew's Trust Church Ruin won't be possible from Chantry Lane. However, subject to agreement with City of York Council and also the 
uh, landowner St Andrew's Trust, we may be able to put signage up on Ferry Lane to say that that path may be accessible uh, from Ferry Lane. However, it will not be accessible from Chantry Lane. But as I've stated, that will be would be subject to agreement with the council and St Andrew's Trust, the landowner. The only other point we would advise is when we actually test and install the floodgate at the end of the works, there may be a partial closure of Chantry Lane, and this would be um, at the eastern extent whilst we actually install that and fit the floodgate. And obviously we have to test it to ensure that it's fit for purpose and it is able to keep water out from the dry side of Chantry Lane. Just in terms of Bishop Thought Road, um, when we get there, we will have traffic management uh, in the form of traffic lights. They will be there when we're at the Bishop Thought Road end. They won't be there all the time when we're at the other end of Chantry Lane. Um, we'll seek to minimise road closures as much as possible. And also we'll have diversions and signage in place. Um, and any diversion uh, from say Chantry Lane or, or what have you, the alternative route is via Main Street. Once we've completed our scheme and we have removed the site compound and all the flood defences are completed, there will be no impact on large vehicular access that goes to St Andrew's Trust land. As we've already mentioned, the floodgate opening is five metres wide, which is sufficient for most vehicles, if not all. And also, the railings at St Andrew's Trust Land are demountable, so that means that they just lift off. So a vehicle will be able to drive straight through the five metre wide gap in the floodgate and then straight into St Andrew's Trust Land. And that means that their access requirements uh, are maintained uh, following completion of our works. Okay. Another key element which we know people are concerned about is noise and vibration. Again, this is documented in the planning conditions for our scheme and have to be approved by City of York Council. So we will use noise and monitoring equipment and we'll install this in front of properties on Chantry Lane during our key construction activities. So whilst we're undertaking the work, we've engaged with our specialist suppliers to use specialist equipment, which will seek to minimize noise, but also vibration. So we're looking at silent piling methods, which are widely available in the industry. And um, we are in the current process of uh, getting these suppliers and partners on board for undertaking the works next year. How we will monitor vibration. So as I've said, we will install the equipment outside the properties and mainly this noise monitoring will be there for any cranes that will be used on site for delivering the construction activities, but also any pumps that will need to be used to take the flow from the surface water network away from the area to prevent any flooding. Any vibration limits, um, we have uh, limits that will be set by City of York Council and we'll be working and adhering to British standards whilst we're undertaking the works. Um, and this takes into account any vibrations uh, and we'll be able to confirm the uh, vibration and noise levels from our equipment to City of York Council uh, ahead of these conditions actually being uh, approved for us for the project. Just another thing I'd like to point out is in, there will be uh, a small element of noise from activities in the working area. So, for example, we're going to seek to minimise dust and noise and then, sorry, dust and airborne pollution from cutting of materials. Uh, so we'll, we'll aim to do wet cutting where possible. And also some of our uh, brickwork and coping stones, we will obtain those pre-drilled. So we have to minimize uh, drilling and noise from drilling uh, on site as well. So we're looking at opportunities to minimize disruption to residents. Okay. In terms of the environmental impact, um, we've undertaken a number of surveys and a number of studies. And this is to look at how our works will impact on the immediate area. We're aware we're working within the Bishop Thorpe Conservation Area, and we've had numerous meetings and dialogue with the conservation specialist from City of York Council. 
We've undertaken BAT, NEWT and Badger surveys within the Dell and, uh, and surrounding area. We've also undertaken archaeological surveys with York Archaeological Trust, in addition to looking at some of the uh, root establishment areas, but also are there any finds uh, within the area of the Dell, but also the uh, field where the site compound will be located. We have confirmed that there are invasive species present in the Dell in the form of Himalayan balsam and Japanese knotweed. So as part of our works, we will have a biohazard management plan that will be compiled by our construction partner. And basically what that means is we will secure the area where these invasive species are so that we do not um, trample any seeds and then spread that invasive, uh, invasive plant as part of our works. And a lot of the um, other restrictions that will, will be covered in our construction environmental management plan. This is a formal document that our contractor and partner uh, provides the City of York Council. And this covers how we will undertake the works, how we will minimize um, airborne pollution or aerial, sorry, and water pollution as well and noise and vibrations. So it's similar to what, what we've covered in the last couple of slides. Okay. The only other thing I would advise is when we're undertaking the work, so any tree felling and any uh, specialist environmental or ecological surveys, we will have uh, independent specialists present to undertake watching briefs for birds and bats. And also we have an archeological watching brief that will be um, delivered by uh, an archeologist whilst we're on site. Um, and that's already one of the conditions which we've uh, which we're discharging at present with City of York Council. Okay, just moving on. So the thing that everybody is quite interested in is how long are we going to be here doing it? So on the screen, the construction timeline. So as I've mentioned, our planning conditions were approved in winter, well, or autumn, sorry, our planning conditions were approved in August this year, and we're discharging those conditions prior to construction starts between then and early 2021. It's our intent to prepare the construction compound as close to construction start so that we don't inconvenience residents uh, any longer than we may have to. And subject to us starting on site early in 2021, we're expecting to be completed and reinstating the areas and off site by autumn or the end of autumn. Again, it's obviously subject to the conditions being approved and us being given the consent to actually start works on site. But we're expecting an eight to nine month window of time for that. Okay, I'll pass over to Ed, who's gonna cover the engagement and risks. Thanks so much, Andrew, and thanks, uh, Kathy. Um, so just a little bit at the end, I'm mindful of the time uh, that we've been presenting for. So it's just to obviously flag, um, I know Andrew's touched on it, but program risks um, it kind of goes without saying that there are things that we can foresee and some things that we can't foresee and things that we aren't entirely in control of. Um, so I'd say we're working on satisfying the planning conditions, but that also uh, depends on what CYC come back to us with. Um, we will be seeking the flood risk activity permit, um, and that will need to be improved, approved when certain time frames. Um, there's obviously the issue of raised river levels and what consequences that might have for construction. Obviously, unfortunately, COVID as we start uh, a new lockdown tomorrow, um, hopefully that's as short as possible. And then there's the issue of either unknown archeology span or unmapped utilities. Um, in terms of engagement um, and what we're kind of doing and hoping to continue doing, um, just to flag what we're doing and what how you can engage with us. So um, we'll uh, at appropriate time send out newsletters via the electronic mailing list and post updates to social media. Um, we have set up a call center phone line whereby if there are people who struggle with emails or um, don't have access to the internet that you might are aware of, you might be more comfortable with a phone call. Uh, they can ring our National Customer Center, they'll take down the question, they can email us, and then we'll ring that person back. Um, we'll also continue to host virtual events where appropriate, uh, post the notice boards, which Andrew referred to, and if necessary or uh, suitable, um, send out more surveys to get your thoughts on what you'd like us to kind of communicate on. Um, in terms of what the community can do, well, we encourage emails to your flood plan. 
Um, we have this electronic mailing list. So if you're not signed up to that, please let us know or please let other people know of it and we can get them added. Uh, obviously, please respond to surveys. We had 47 responses, which was great. And uh, you know, please come to these events, although I appreciate it's taking time out of your evenings. Um, so we appreciate you kind of, uh, making time for us. Um, and just a summary of what we're aiming to complete before the year end, well, satisfy those planning conditions, submit our flood risk activity permit application, complete the road safety audit, uh, complete the dilapidation surveys done in conjunction with city CYC highways, um, and do the tree felling and vegetarian veget vegetation clearance, not vegetarian, uh, uh, that would be me being cleared, and uh, install information boards. And obviously, at all times, try and comply with the COVID-19 procedures. So that brings us to uh, the end of the presentation. And we're going to switch over to the q and I can see we've already got 37 questions, although one of those was just us to get the ball rolling. So 36, really. So that's great. Thank you so much. And just as going to recap of how I'm going to go about this. So I'll just read out the quote, uh, sorry, the question as it's written. And then I'll direct that to either to Andrew or Kathy. Um, we'll go with the questions which have the most thumbs up, because that's what you've said you want us to focus on. Um, but we'll also try and uh, divvy it up. So, for instance, if one person's asking lots of questions, then we might try and look to see if there's someone who hasn't had an opportunity to ask a question and go to theirs next. So I'll try and strike the right balance. Sometimes the things move upon, up across the screens when new questions are added or people vote, so it can get a little hectic. So I apologize in advance, but I will do my best to kind of, I suppose, cover as many as possible in the 45 minutes that we've got. Um, so the number one or the top ranked question at the moment is uh, 30 plus objections were ignored from Church Lane and St. Bulk Lane residents regarding the compound and were deleted from the planning application. Why? Well, I can kind of cover that because this is a question for CYC. Um, we don't know about the status of um, comments on the CYC planning portal. We don't have any influence over that. Um, so unfortunately, I know it's a top ranked question, but it's not actually something we can cover. That's a question for uh, CYC. Um, so uh, sorry about that. Um, the next question is, why did Church Lane residents only have three weeks to object to the site compound location when the flood work scheme as a whole has been ongoing for years? Unfortunately, that's also another CYC question. Um, we don't determine the kind of the period whereby um, uh, there is this consultation period that CYC have, um, so that's very much a question for them. But these questions will still go into the written summary that we circulate afterwards, and we do have CYC or members of CYC, like local councillors, on that mailing list. So at least that these questions will be alerted to them. Next question. An alternative site compound location was proposed to be located on the field opposite the crematorium. Why was this not even acknowledged or considered? Um, and I'll address this question to Kathy, please. Thank you, Ed. Um, would it be possible for you to um, go back to slide 21? Um, I don't uh, know if you can do that. We can try. <laughs> Sorry if that's going to mess things up. Um, I, it's I, just, I just it's... hope the, uh, the questions remain when I go back. Uh, this is new to uncharted territory. Uh, could you remind me which slide you wanted to go to? Sorry. 21, please, which is the location of the compound. That's the one. I think it's easier to explain um, when you have this, this map in front of you. So the locations that we looked at, and indeed this is one of the ones that we that we considered, is across the road from the crematorium. Um, unfortunately, as you can see in the map, the area floods, um, and also there is road flooding there, which would cut off access between the working area and the compound, which is not really acceptable. The um, exit from this site would be into a 60 mile an hour limit. Um, just as you come down the hill um, from over the bridge uh, down into Bishop Thorpe. And that is not really from a, a road safety perspective is not really an option. Um, there is also just, uh, um, um, just further up the road, there is the bus stop and the entrance into the, the crematorium itself. So again, areas where there's a certain amount of toing and froing of other traffic, um, both coming onto and leaving the road. So uh, certainly for the flooding aspect and for the, ex the exits onto 60 mile an hour 
um, zone, then that would that would be a problem. Um, the other thing I think it's worth pointing out is that had we chosen the compound there, delivery vehicles would have needed to come down Church Lane to get to it. Um, it is not um, an option to divert uh, delivery vehicles coming off the A64 into town to cut across through Tadcaster Road to come back up Bishop Thorpe Road to be able to come into the village that way. The deliveries need to come down Simbok Lane. Um, so as, uh, as an alternative, uh, the, the positives maybe are not as much as you would think uh, and the negatives certainly ruled it out. I hope that answers the question. Um, if not, please come back to us. Um, we can provide you with more, more information later. Thanks very much, Kathy. Um, I'm just gonna rattle through the presentation slides as I don't quite trust the Q&A shortcut. So apologies for everyone seeing that again. Um, so yeah, let's just take that one. The next question, um, why has the site for the compound been considered when in close proximity to an infant school? Um, if I could go back to you, Kathy, on that one, um, because it's about the compound. Sorry, I got myself muted again there. Okay. Um, as I've said, we've considered a number of different areas um, and I appreciate that it's proximity to the, uh, the pedestrian entrance to the infant school is a problem. And this is one of the reasons why um, an original location for the compound, which was actually further up towards the Symbolk Lane Junction, um, was rejected by City of York Council um, and why they asked that it be moved further down. Um, so the, the compound now sits outside the 20 mile an hour limit, which is um, set aside as the set down area for the school. Um, uh, so we have, we, had, we have attempted to manage the risk of that as much as we can um, with two schools um, in Bishop Thorpe and with the two entrances, it is unavoidable um, to have to use Church Lane in some, in, in some uh, way or other um, in order to access the site and access the compound. Thank you, Kathy. Next question is from David Lozeby. Why was the scheme approved under delegated powers given the impact of a his, uh, to an historic site and the Greenbelt land outside the YCC development plan? Um, unfortunately, I believe that's another question for York City Council. Um, so um, in terms of you know, uh, why it's approved, that's not something that we um, have a responsibility for. Oh, it's just moved, so I'll just take that. Uh, next question from Paul Crooks. Please confirm that pedestrian access to the beautiful Riverside Walk, which passes over land owned by St. Andrew's Trust, will remain in the future. And if I could direct that question to Andrew, please. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So, as we've said, once we've completed our works, there won't be any impact to St. Andrew's Trust land. All our gates and our flood walls are external of the St. Andrew's Trust railings access to the permissive path will still be maintained. People will still be able to get to it from Chantry Lane once we've completed our works. And also whilst we're undertaking our works, uh, as we mentioned before, the, there is the opportunity subject to agreement from the landowners and also City of York Council for the Riverside footpath to be accessed from Ferry Lane. But again, as we are not the owner and we're not the planning authority, that would be subject to discussions with development parties. Thank you, Andrew. Um, next question um, is from David Lozeby again. Um, will you be reinstating mature trees? Uh, if I could address that to you, Andrew. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So any trees that will be removed will be taken away. Um, one, as part of the felling activities, so we won't be storing any trees on site on Chantry Lane. Um, we are seeking with our landscape specialists to install uh, or replant trees uh, in the dell in key areas, trees that may be a bit more mature rather than saplings and also trees that are in keeping. But again, the dell is private land, so we will be uh, talking and continuing our engagement with the landowner in terms of the types of trees they would like and also the size. Okay. 
hand. Ed, I think you're still on mute. Really wanted to make it through an entire meeting without uh, being on mute, but unfortunately called myself out. It was just to say, unfortunately, I clicked complete on a question that had just shifted. So um, just to ask Emily if she could have a look to see what question I accidentally ticked, uh, which needs to be reinstated. Uh, so I apologize to whoever had a question just lined up there. It just shifted at the last second, but we'll try and get that back. So it's addressed. Um, and I'll take the right one, which is the mature trees question. Um, the next question is from Gemma Barker. Um, the traffic is extremely bad on Church Lane. I have many pictures to prove this. If all the cars are parked, how do you intend to do your deliveries? If I could address that to Andrew again, please. Okay, so the deliveries that will go to the sites, the majority of them will go directly to Chantry Lane as that's gonna be the working area for the project. Um, all of the uh, other deliveries, smaller deliveries and any fabrication that will need to be done can be done in a lay down area in the site compound. So the deliveries and also the site traffic for the operatives, that will all go into the compound area. It's one of the requirements of City of York Council's Highways Department that we minimise our impacts onto Church Lane as much as possible. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the next question is from Gemma Barker again. Um, the lay buys are where the cottages park their cars. School traffic goes all the way up to church, uh, up Church Lane. Have you investigated this and been to site at busy times? If I could address that to you, Andrew. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I have been to Bishop Thorpe on numerous occasions. And I've actually been there when it's been school leaving and collection times of children. And I have seen how busy it is. I would note that Main Street especially is very, very congested where there is the junction with Symbolt Lane because you have uh, two schools there. And also, as you go up Symbolt Lane, uh, where you've got the main entrance to the infant school, that is incredibly busy. And also the 20 mile an hour limit on Church Lane, um, where you have the laybys and where you have the parents collecting their children from school. So, yeah, fully understand that. Um, so we have been there when it's been busy. And as I said, our site compound has been moved further down. We have talked with our stakeholders about where to put it and also to try and minimise disruption where possible. Um, and as we've already stated, we're seeking to prevent deliveries and traffic where there's peak drop off times and rush hour times in Bishop Thorpe. Thank you, Andrew. Next question from David Lozeby. From your presentation, it is clear that the true dynamics of people and vehicle movements have not been fully reconciled in relation to a temporary site compound. So that's more of a comment than a question. Um, Andrew, did you want to reply to that comment at all? Um, yes, I think that may need a bit more detailed answer. So I'd rather we could take that offline and then we can respond to David Lowesby afterwards, yeah. if that's all right. So um, I believe Emily will have shared in the chat the York flood plan. If you wanted to contact us about that, David, we can then uh, follow up on that one. Next question is from Gemma Barker. Uh, road flooding. I have never seen it opposite the crematorium. The speed limit is not 60 miles per hour on this road. You are wrong. Um, I'll address that question to you, Kathy, as she was talking about the crematorium. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, the flooding issue is mainly for the site itself. Um, our concerns about, about flooding of the site and its suitability as a compound. Um, I apologise if I've got the speed limit wrong, but the exit from the site that was suggested to us was is definitely outside the 30 mile an hour limit. Um, so that is that is one of the reasons why it was rejected. Um, so I will check that. However, I'm, I'm pretty certain it is outside the 30 mile an hour and opposite the entrance to the crematorium and just adjacent to the bus stop. Thank you, Kathy. Next question is from David Lozeby. Why is the temporary site compound located in the school drop-off zone and doctor's surgery? Uh, that one for Andrew, please. Okay, I think we've already covered part of that. Um, we're not in the drop-off location or the 20 mile an hour demarcation zone for the school. Um, the doctor's surgery, I know there is parking in the uh, St. Andrew's Church uh, car park for the doctors for the actual general practitioners um, 
having been to Bishop Thornton numerous times, I've never seen an issue with parking on this on Church Lane for doc, for people attending the surgery. And also, given that we're in COVID restrictions, um, GPs and practices are not seeing as many patients as they used to. Now, obviously, none of us can predict the impact or the longevity of lockdowns and COVID, but that is something where there are fewer people actually having physical appointments with the GPs. So at the moment, um, there isn't a lot to suggest that there is congestion in front of the GPs on Church Lane, but, you know, should we see that when we're there on site, we will look to revisit our deliveries and revisit our plans so we don't cause any congestion issue. Thank you. Next question is anonymous. Um, why have the EA not considered access from the river as with other schemes towards York, negating the damage to Green Belt? If I could send that back to you, Andrew. Absolutely. So we've engaged with our contractor and our partners um, regarding the 19 projects that we're doing as part of the York for alleviation scheme portfolio. The problem with bringing things in by river is you have double handling of materials because you have to load it from a, uh, a large goods vehicle onto a boat, move it down the river on a barge, then you have to offload it, then you have to store it, then you have to use the material to create the defences. The cost of double handling actually is significant and what that does is it makes the scheme uneconomic because you've got all the labour costs, you've got the transport costs, and then you've got the safety costs with working in proximity to the river and actually in the river sometimes to actually do this. Um, I won't talk about any other areas, but this has been considered and it's been ruled out on a number of flood cells across the York flood alleviation portfolio. Thank you very much. Now I've just, although we're trying to prioritize the most, most thumbs up, I um, appreciate a lot of questions are coming from one or two individuals. So we want to make sure that there is a bit, you know, that everyone gets a chance. So I've just picked the next named person who hasn't asked a question yet, who's got the most thumbs up, which is why I've chosen Jessica's. Um, it's a question from Jessica, which says, please, can you confirm that you will now engage with St. Andrew's Trust to maintain access to the Riverside Path? If I could address that question to you, Kathy, please. Thanks, said um, Absolutely, indeed. Um, apart from the engagement we will be doing and have been doing with all residents of Chantry Lane and, and St Andrew's Trust as well, um, with regard to restricting the access during our works, um, we'll be working with residents to try and minimise the impact as much as possible on access, but there will be uh, an impact during the works. With regard to ongoing access uh, to St Andrew's Trust land, the finished scheme will not impact access to that land. There will, the pedestrian access will remain um, and the access onto St Andrew's land will still be available through the five metre gate. The exception being, of course, when there is flooding happening and the gate will then be closed. Um, we are happy to talk with St Andrew's Trust on this matter at any time. Um, however, um, the design, as we've shown you this evening, uh, maintains large vehicle access and pedestrian access onto the land beyond the scheme. Um, so that, that's all I can, I can say about that. Thank you, Kathy. Um, the next question is, uh, uh, is why is City of York, sorry, I put that thing in the way, why is City of York Council not involved in this meeting? Um, so they were invited to this meeting, but um, we are hosting this meeting as um, the Environment Agency, so it's just addressing kind of our aspects to the scheme and our, our detail, um, rather than a kind of a, a jointly hosted meeting. Um, that's just a, so we could uh, kind of focus on what we wanted to talk about. Um, I would encourage you to contact City of York Council uh, with these questions relating to um, City of York Council's role in this. Um, as I say, this question will go in the summary after the event so that they can see this and that's a chance for them to get in touch or respond. Um, the next three questions from uh, David Lozaby. So uh, I will just, again, just prioritize a question from someone who hasn't had a chance to ask a good question yet. I believe next question is... So, Maria, 
It says on one of the slides that for every one tree removed, five will be planted. Please, can you tell me where these trees will be planted and when? Thank you. Um, I'll address that question to Andrew, please. Yeah, that's fine. So three months after commencement of our construction works, we will be submitting a plan to City of York Council to address one of our conditions regarding where we're going to replant the trees and in details of the types of trees and native species. Um, this is something that is worked up by our landscape specialists and also these trees are agreed with the landowners. So we already know that there is going to be a quantity of tree replacement in the Dell and potentially uh, further into the grounds of Bishop Thorpe Palace. Again, subject to agreement with the landowner. Um, and also at present, we're undertaking numerous pieces of work to identify other locations to replant these trees, ideally within Bishop Thorpe. However, um, there are other schemes and other organisations uh, such as Tree Mendes and City of York Council have also got schemes they want to implement for tree planting. So we link in with them and identify locations. But for the moment, three months after we start construction, we'll be submitting the plans, but we're doing this piece of work and continuing to do this piece of work to identify where they're going to go. Thank you, Andrew. And again, just to prioritize a question from someone who has not had a question yet. Uh, Derek Watts, as the street lights are being removed along Chantry Lane during the works, what provision has been made to keep the lane adequately illuminated? I'll send that over to Andrew again, please. Okay. So the, I believe the cast iron street lights, those will be removed and stored, safely stored and securely stored as part of the works. Um, temporary street lighting will be installed on Chantry Lane whilst we undertake the construction works. And this will be directed, obviously, away from the residential properties because nobody wants a street light shining into, directly into your house. Um, once we've completed the works, we will reinstate the river wash cobbles, which form the base for these cast iron lights. And then we will reinstall these lights and connect them after the works. Thank you very much. And just to see if there's anyone else who hasn't asked, we've got, oh yes. Uh, so it's a question from Graham Kennedy. Uh, I suggest that the fence line on top of the wall is too high and should only be the height of the existing fence height. Can this height be amended? So um, if I could address that to Kathy, please. Sorry, a moment there to unmute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Edward. Um, yes, as I think I said in the presentation, the intention is that the overall height of the fence and wall together, together will be the same as it is existing at the moment. Um, so the fence will actually be shorter than it is at the moment because the wall is taller. Um, so I think if I've understood Mr. Kennedy's question, um, he's, um, he's absolutely right. That, that that is the intention in the design. So uh, that is that is what the design is at the moment. Thank you. And just to press, it's uh, it's anonymous, so it might be someone new or might be someone who's asked a question previously. Um, and then we've still got plenty of time, so we should be able to address David's questions as and remaining questions as well. Um, will there be a banksman traffic traffic marshal at the compound entrance? If I could send that question to Andrew, please. Yes, there will. Um, for any large vehicles that will be exiting the site compound, that is a requirement that we have asked our contractor to implement. Um, and there is also the intent of using sentries where possible if we need as a backup in terms of uh, traffic lights or in addition to traffic lights. Okay. It, will be, it will be for large vehicles. It will be for large deliveries. Um, not necessarily for people driving the car out of the compound, however, but for large vehicles, large deliveries, yes. And also our compound is designed in accordance with uh, input from City of York Highways so that we wouldn't actually be reversing out onto Church Lane. This is one of the key conditions and criteria set by the Highways Authority, which we have amended our compound design to adhere to. Thank you, Andrew. And just to process another anonymous um what action are you taking to ensure no damage to the fabric and foundations of the old church if i could send that to kathy please 
as with um, all of the um, old, old properties that are on Chantry Lane, um, the method of piling that we have chosen, um, the geek and push method of piling, is one that produces a very, very low um, vibration rate. So um, that is the, the, the first, the first um, a point to make with regard to how we're trying to ensure that we, we, um, we can protect um, the, the buildings on Chantry Lane. Um, the uh, piling is actually some way away from, from the building, um, from the ruin. Um, and also um, one, of the, one of the issues, of course, with uh, the suggestion that we, we have deliveries from the riverbank, um, we will not be using any of that area either for deliveries, storage, or anything else beyond the end of Chantry Lane. So we're keeping the works away from the ruin. We'll be monitoring vibration. We have chosen a piling method um, that deliberately, that is very low vibration. Um, so those are the, um, uh, those are the, the mitigation that we put in place at the moment. Um, if monitoring shows that vibration levels are, um, are rising, uh, then we do have alternative uh, approaches uh, where we can pre-auger the piles um, and that can, that can help when we're driving, that can help to uh, reduce the vibration as well. So monitoring in place, mitigation and uh, choice of, of uh, construction method in the first place. Thanks very much, Kathy. Um, I'm going to send another question your way as well, just, just to prep you. Um, Before I just, unmute. <laughs> <laughs> just for someone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet. Um, so this question is from Hilary Burton. How can you ensure that the impact of installing the six metre deep piling will not damage the historic houses along Chantry Lane and Priory Corner? Um, I think I've, I've I covered a certain amount of this maybe um, in my previous answer. So um, the use, the main one is the use of the piling. Uh, uh, method uh, that we're using to mitigate um, the vibration um, and we do have a as I said an alternative um, approach or, a, or a, um, a slight change to the approach that would reduce it further if, if that was necessary. Um, there will be monitoring in place. Um, we are doing pre-conditioned surveys across the whole area um, so we can monitor the, uh, the pre-works condition and, and as we go along. Um, and those are all things, all things we are putting in place to mitigate the risk and to reduce the risk where we can. Great, many thanks, Kathy. Um, and just to say at this point, um, and you know there's been a couple of questions which are for CYC. Um, so what we're looking to do is group those questions and then we'll send a separate email to CYC to try and get answers uh, to those questions for you. And then once we get those answers, we can send them via the electronic mailing list. Um, just to, uh, there's a couple more people left who have not had a chance to ask a question. So I'm just gonna prioritize them. Um, so next up is T Tim Holstead. It's the temporary pump for the exclusive use of this scheme. Where will it be stored? How can we be sure it won't be redeployed elsewhere when there is flooding? And I'll come back to you, Kathy, um, as you talked about that in your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Ed. So unfortunately, we've not been able to provide a dedicated pump um, as part of the scheme. Um, there are challenges around doing this in any flood scheme. Um, and as I explained that when we are in a flood situation, um, those partners that sign up to the local resilience forum um, work together to ensure that pumps are provided across the board where they are needed subject to the requirements um, at the time. Um, I think you'll know that back in February, City of York Council provided, uh, had pumps on hand ready to use at Chantry Lane. Um, uh, and uh, historically, City of York have done that in the past. I believe Yorkshire Water have also pumped at this location. So um, we are unable to provide a dedicated pump. However, the need for pumping at this location will be built into the emergency plans that we put into operation when we go into flood mode in York. Um, so the City of York um, emergency flood plan um, and the environment agencies uh, 
uh, manual for uh, working with partners to manage and to deliver that flood response that we see uh, that happens all too frequently, sadly, in York and is actually um, in, in place at the moment. Many thanks, Kathy. Um, again, just to prioritise someone who hasn't had a question yet. Uh, this is from David N. Um, will you or CYC have a full photo and structural survey of the condition of all roads used in construction so remedial work is carried out at no cost to CYC? And if I could send that to Andrew to give Kathy a rest. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So City of York Council have asked us to undertake delapidation surveys and condition surveys of the roads that will be affected from our works. Um, this is what we'll do with our construction partner and we will do that prior to any works commencing. The surveys will be in attendance with a highways officer from City of York Council and as stated before, they will be signing off the condition surveys. So any reinstatement we do will be to the standard of the road prior to our works being undertaken or better. Um, prior is a minimum, better if possible, subject to funding. Um, as we are spending uh, public money here, so we need to make sure we deliver value for money. Um, and as it will be approved by City of York Council, uh, it's for them to comment on whether there's any further works. We can't comment on any highway schemes that City of York Council are undertaking, but to date, they have advised us that they are not intending to undertake any schemes on Church Lane, Bishopthorpe, uh, Bishopthorpe Road, uh, and also Chantry Lane. Not whilst we're doing our works. Thank you, Andrew. So um, that covers all the remaining questions that by people who hadn't had a chance to ask a question yet, which is great. It's always nice to make sure that everyone gets a chance. Uh, thank you to David Lozaby for your patience. I know your questions have been waiting in terms of the most thumbs up. Uh, so we'll come back to some of your remaining questions now. Um, so the first one is, would you voluntarily sign up to a service level agreement with St. Andrew's Trust and the Bishop Thorpe Action Planning Group? And if I could send that to Andrew first, and if Kathy wants to add anything more. Yeah, this, this is an item that would be referred to our legal team um, in terms of any agreements and with any third parties, as obviously the Environment Agency, we don't own any property on Chantry Lane or in Bishopthorpe. So we would need to go through a formal legal process if we were to do that. But obviously it's something that needs to be referred to our legal experts um, within the wider environment agency and DEFRA group. Thank you. Uh, next question from David Lozaby. Why can't we have temporarily, uh, temporary sorry, speed limits to make other temporary site locations viable? This is common practice. If I could send that to Kathy, please. Um, I think that's something that we'd have to discuss with the Highways Authority. Um, to my knowledge, it's not anything that we've used in York. Um, and uh, whereas having um, identified a compound that the Highways Authority were happy with, um, with regard to the uh, positioning um, of, the, of the compound where it is, um, uh, I, I've, I've not, I've, don't have any knowledge of that having been used elsewhere and I'm not I do not know if it's something that would be uh, acceptable to City of York Council. Thank you Kathy. Um, next question from David Lozby. Why are visual drawings issued uh, sorry why are the visual drawings issued not representative of reality distorting the visual perspectives of, for the community? I know, Kathy, you talked a little bit about the challenges of trying to put a very wide uh, image into something that we can include in a presentation, but mm -hmm. if you could just uh, add any comments. Um, I think um, the visual drawings give an overall look. Um, they need to be looked at in conjunction with the plan drawings, so the, the, the view from above, if you like, um, of what the um, scheme is going to look like. Um, we cannot wave a magic wand and, and, and have a perfect representation. Um, but I think it, it, I would advise people to look at our visualizations, but also to look at the plans where um, the, actual, um, uh, the actual measurements are set out. Um, so if you look at a picture and you say, well, that's looking a lot wider than it should be, 
go to the plans, have a look at the plans, and you'll be able to see the um, uh, the, the actual measurements on the ground uh, there. And it's a combination of those things to, to give you an idea of of, of what the um, what the what the dimensions will be of the finished scheme. Thank you. Um, we just had a, a new question from someone who hasn't asked a question yet, so I'm just going to highlight that. Um, so Stuart Harrison asks, who are the Bishop Forbes Action Planning Group? Um, if I could direct that to uh, Kathy, please. Um, as far as I am aware, the Bishop Thorpe Action Planning Group, we have received um, a couple of pieces of correspondence from them. And I believe they are a group that have been formed from uh, concerned residents on Church Lane um, who have um, uh, uh, commissioned uh, a uh, planning consultant uh, to act on their behalf. Um, we have not received the information yet with regard to how many residents they represent. Um, so that is that is in the process of, of correspondence we have with them at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, we are, we're waiting to, uh, to hear how many residents um, on Church Lane they represent um, and we'll provide them with, with information um, with, the, with the questions that they ask. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next question is from Anonymous. Uh, the site traffic will pass a second entrance exit in school on Church Lane, which is very busy at drop off, pick off, pick up times. Has this been considered? Um, Andrew, uh, you've, you've covered this uh, a few times, but is there anything more that you'd like to add? Not, um, I don't really think there's actually anything else to add from what we've already discussed. Um, we do know that it is a secondary access. We're staying away from the primary and main access to the infant school. And we know that this is a footpath access and it's mainly um, used to drop off and pick up children. And given it's an infant school, the expectation would be that all children would be escorted by a responsible adult um, as it's down to a duty of care. Um, so we're seeking to minimize our interactions with uh, that part of Church Lane as much as possible and avoid drop off times and avoid school times and avoid interactions as much as possible. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next um, question is, oh, sorry, Kathy. Well, I, I was just going to say it has been considered um, and um, the consideration is between one um, pedestrian access to the school um, as opposed to the main entrance to the school and then conflict with the junior school at the bottom of Simbolk Lane. Um, so yes, it, it has been considered. Thank you. Um, next question is from David Lozaby. Why is the flood defences not set at the river edge as they are in the centre of York? If I could send that question to Kathy, please. Thank you, Edward. Um, the, there are a number of, of reasons for this. Um, one of the first ones is that in order to achieve the um, flood defence height, um, above sea level, which is what we're looking at, um, the wall at the river's edge would need to be about two meters tall, um, because the uh, the uh, view the uh, land drops away as you get closer to the river. So uh, the need would be for a much a much uh, taller flood wall um, to reach the same the same level above sea level. Um, there are also some difficult construction um, aspects of having to construct from the river. Um, I cannot for one minute think that we would um, attempt to put construction traffic past St Andrew's Ruin um, or indeed attempt to gain access from the bottom of Ferry Lane onto that stretch of land. So all works would need to be carried out from the river, which um, is exceptionally um, expensive. And there are also considerable health and safety um, issues with that. Um, we also um, uh, would uh, have to think of uh, the impact both upstream and downstream 
um, of extorting hard defences right on the riverbank in that way, as that can lead to erosion issues upstairs, uh, upstream and downstream. Um, so we have we have had this um, this question before. Um, from from a, an interested uh, member of, of a resident of Bishop Thorpe, um, so I have put some information together, technical information together before um, for that for that gentleman's interest. So I'm quite happy to to put that together into the um, question and answer um, documents that we we are hoping to put out after the meeting. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, next question is from Jessica. Will you contact St Andrew's Trust regarding floodgate alternative plan and undertake to negotiate with the trust regarding the floodgate? Uh, sure, it's too small for access. Um, Andrew, you spoke about the, um, the space available um, at the gate. Um, could you uh, go over this one, please? Yeah, absolutely. So the floodgate's got a five metre wide opening, which is sufficient for all vehicles, including emergency vehicles as well. Um, we have previously been in contact with St Andrew's Trust and we have been talking to them about our plans. Um, this was back in 2019. Um, obviously, we have correspondence from people across Bishop Club. So we will consider and we will uh, re-engage with St Andrew's Trust. We're happy to do that. Um, and in terms of the floodgate, the actual operation of the floodgate when it is opened... Um, it will not actually impact on their land. It will swing back and over the highway, which will be retained as the CYC, City of York Council Highway, and the gates will pin back against the wall and there will not be any impact on any other party's land. It will all be within uh, City of York Council Highway boundaries. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the next question uh, is a quick one. It's more of a comment uh, for Andrew and for everyone. Uh, the site compound looks like a prison. Is this appropriate? That's a question by David Lozaby. Um, it's up to our contractors to tell us how they want to secure their compound. Um, at the end of the day, we have to secure the compound, the machinery, the equipment, but also the people who are within it. Um, as we have seen in numer on numerous construction projects of varying sizes, there are always uh, opportunists who will try and gain access to a compound. And our contractors, as well as ourselves, we've got a duty of care and safety to protect the public from accessing our compound from safety reasons and safety grounds, but we've also got to make it secure for our site personnel. So. Again, it's up to our contractors to tell us what type of fencing and materials they want to use, but we do have to make it secure. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we're starting to get close to eight o'clock, so we'll maybe just cover, say, three more questions, and then those remaining questions, they will still be archived, and what we'll do is then include in the written summary that we send around responses to those questions to make sure that they're answered. So I'll just take that one. Next question is from Gemma Barker. I have pictures from just today of how busy Church Lane is. To the point people are parked over driveways on Church Lane. I have pictures I can send to you, send you them. Um, Gemma, if, uh, if you want to send us food, that's great. Um, it's York Flood Plan at environment-agency.gov.uk. Um, so um, I say Andrew has been down to the site, but um, yep, yeah, always keen to hear from the community. Thank you. Uh, next question is from David. Uh, David N. How long will access to the old church and access to the footpath from Chantry Lane to the river bank, bank down to Acaster? I think that's in terms of it being shut. Um, so, Kathy, um, if you could just quickly cover that. Um, as a maximum for the duration of the works. So that would could be nine months. Um, as we said in the presentation, we are doing everything we can to phase the works um, so that as we move back up Chantry Lane, both with the piling, the concreting, the reinforcements, the building of the, of the wall, the coping, the fencing, we'll be doing that in phases and moving back up. Subject to the safety for the public, safety for our staff on site, we will open access on Chantry Lane as soon as we can. Um, and by taking this phased approach, we hope that there will be 
areas that there will be uh, sections of time where certain access will be open. Um, but at this moment in time, um, we would have to say up to a maximum of the duration of the works, which is nine months. Um, however, once the traffic order is removed at the end of construction, then access on Trunk Tree Lane will be open. Thank you, Kathy. Um, the next question is from Anonymous. Uh, some of us have the feeling that all objections are simply to be tolerated and then ignored. Have all uh, alternative suggestions to both been properly examined? Um, well, we're sorry that um, there's that feeling. Uh, certainly we do not look to uh, um, ignore any objections. And what we're trying to do always through a project is kind of engage with the community and understand what the concerns are, um, what people are wanting, um, and then trying to obviously match that with um, what we have to do and what our commitments are and what uh, criteria that we have to kind of adhere to in terms of policies and procedures and just try and find an outcome that kind of pleases the most, uh, the most people and it's the most uh, was efficient. Um, Kathy, would you like to uh, kind of add any comments on that? Um Alternative suggestions, um, whenever a scheme is put together, and this is why they take a long time to put together, um, York Flood Plan is indeed actually quite an accelerated plan of works um, in that um, it was it, it's uh, running into it, its fifth year now. Um, so right at the beginning, we look at um, the potential options that are available we cannot investigate every design option to the nth degree, um, otherwise there would be no money left in the pot to build it. So as we proceed through identifying options, assessing the best way forward, um, options have to be taken to some, to, to, to put to one side. Um, and those that are unlikely to either be technically feasible or unlikely to be economically viable have to be put to one side quite early on in the process. Um, if we're that, that's sort of relating to the design of the scheme and, and how we put it together. Um, through the planning process, um, that is obviously City of York Council, they are the planning authority, they have the ultimate decision as to whether to approve the scheme or not. Um, residents put forward their objections to the planning authority. It is the planning authority's role then to balance the requirements of the whole of the authority that they serve. Um, we put forward our scheme, we do it to the best of our ability. What we believe is, is something that is going to be, um, um, it's going to be fundable, it's going to be buildable, and it's going to actually do what it is meant to do. And that is to, to save people from the pain of having their homes flooded um, and then the planning authority needs to balance all of the different concerns and objections to come to their decision and that is what happened in August when we were given planning approval um, for our scheme. As you've heard tonight there are a number of conditions that the authority have placed upon the scheme to ensure that as we move forward into the very fine detail of design and the fine detail of how we are actually going to deliver this on the ground, our method of works, um, that we have got restrictions that the planning authority put around us, that we can build the scheme, but it has to be within those certain, those certain conditions. Um, and that is where we are in the development of the scheme at the moment. Um, so um, I hope that's answered the question. Andrew, would you want to add anything to that? I would just want to say that um, in considering the options and what we can actually do here, we do have to demonstrate value for money that because we are spending government money, public funds, and going through the process in developing the options, we have engaged with our partners um, in terms of our design partners, construction partners, and the planning authority who have been very supportive of our scheme. And this is not just one individual, it's across the piece. So as with the rest of the York Flood Alleviation Scheme, you know, this is work that's been ongoing for a number of years. And the ultimate aim is this is a project that's going to deliver betterment for the community. That is what we're intending to do here. And 
we have to demonstrate that we've considered the options, that we can provide the maximum standard of protection possible, which this scheme does in terms of a 100-year standard of protection, um, and also that we can deliver it safely for the community. And that is what we actually seek to do. And again, we do consult with the stakeholders. We do consult and get support from the local authority to actually try and make this happen. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and thank you, Kathy. Um, we're now at five past eight, so um, we're gonna bring the meeting to a close, um, but we will uh, make sure to get written responses to the remaining questions that we have um, had submitted. Um, just to say thank you very much to everyone who's taken part. We do, if you do have an extra couple of minutes, we do have a couple of feedback questions that we would like to get you to answer if possible. Um, it's just because this is the fifth public event we've done since the first lockdown. So we're still finding our way a little bit about how to do virtual engagement in a way that's kind of safe and inclusive. Um, so if you did have a couple of uh, minutes spare just to go through a couple of questions, um, we'd really appreciate it. If not, you're more than uh, free to go and uh, we hope that you have a lovely evening.